different every time. <laughs> with our new and different bumper music. My name is Steve McDonald. I'm here with Skip Murphy, Mike Rogers, Max Abramson has joined us in the guest chair, and Joe Mandola is still here hanging out to see how much fun it is to be part of this program. The ADD Blogger, the ADD blogger Bunch. That's here. right. I'm only Squirrels. Gonna, I'm only going to turn mics up when I'm ready to. All right, you go ahead and talk because i got to see if I can make this other thing work. Max Abramson, I want to say thank you for coming in to talk with us here at RockCop. Now, you've got an interesting proposition that uh, you want to talk about today. Uh, I'm not sure that proposition is perhaps the, the correct word, but uh, you're bringing uh, the government action uh, to us uh, that should concern us all. So why don't you give us a little bit of a background as Steve is trying to prep uh, some audio to play that you brought in for us. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a... Uh, one of my housemates tried to convince me to go along with the party, and I... And I had a bad feeling about it, and I said, no, I, I, I'm not in favor of allowing that at all. I'm the only person who throws parties in my house, and I only invite people who I know. And, of course, the next day, he and a friend of his started setting up this party anyway, and after a while, guests started arriving. And I had a talk with them, and, he, and he, you know, they just seemed pretty oblivious to the whole problem. And I said, well, I'm going to send these people home. And uh, during, you know, after trying to get people to leave the house, uh, a, a brawl broke out in the house, and this resulted in a self-defense trial. Uh, witnesses admitted at the trial that there was a, a pile or huddle of people on the ground, and that there was a really violent brawl, and the police photo of course were broken glass and blood everywhere. Um, three different witnesses at trial admitted that a woman came downstairs into the basement during this brawl with an upturned knife. Um, she also had a beer bottle in her hand, her other hand, um, and according to police statements and witness statements, uh, she was taking this knife and going at the throat of another woman. Um, and I think that there were, there was evidence of three different attempted murders and numerous felony assaults, criminal trespassing. And, uh, of course, the police let all the criminals go, and uh, they had, in, right there in their own, police reports admissions that the uh, people there admitted that there was in fact a, a pretty bad fight and that the homeowner had fired a warning shot into his backyard in order to break up the fight and get people out of his home and they'd heard from multiple witnesses saying yes the gang leader charged at me and tried to wrestle the gun from me and again all of this came up at, the, at, uh, at trial and so you have you know, New Hampshire is not a license to kill state, it's what some people call it a license to not kill state. In other words, um, you know, in states like Texas, you know, you can shoot a trespasser. In some states, you have the right to use deadly force for almost, almost any reason. The compromise in New Hampshire, they don't allow you to do that, but they allow you to use non-deadly force. The definition of, of deadly force is purposely shooting someone or purposely shooting at someone when it's a firearm. Non-deadly force is anything else. So if you, the, uh, the general court responded to the Lord Bird case um, to specifically insist that if you simply draw your weapon or if you fire a weapon into the ground, um, if you fire away from people, you're using non-deadly force in response. Um, and you can use non-deadly force in New Hampshire, in theory at least, to respond to almost anything. But if you're confronted with deadly force, you're allowed to use either deadly force or non-deadly force. Real quick, those who are not familiar with New Hampshire and are listening from Elle's Place, Ward Bird was a gentleman who had a trespasser on his property who would not leave his property and was becoming, in his description, somewhat difficult. And uh, he basically brandished his firearm. You can call that any way you want. Sometimes so you, you can did, say... did not fire it You did not fire it. You could just remove it from your holster. And he was charged... And that's called brandishing. And that's brandishing. And he was charged with a felony. And he spent Christmas away from his family in prison because of it. That's all he did. So that, that's what he means. So yeah, and that's changed. And some would argue that that's not even non-deadly force. And mm -hmm. Some people would argue that what I, how I, I mean, responded was What if I'm just deadly. checking to see if my safety's up? Exactly. That's not... Which I just did. Force of any kind. So Make sure you do that off camera nowadays. Oh, all right. So we, um, <laughs> we... You should have seen it when Jim Coffee was here. I had a pile of them on the table. It was awesome. And they're all legal. Thank you very much.
Yes. Uh, so we're going to see if we can play a 911 call. Uh, let you me do a product quick, that? quick setup. One of the big questions at trial was, was this a life and death emergency? Or, as the law asks it, could a reasonable person perceive that there is a, an immediate danger? And the prosecutor attempted to argue on closing that after I'd taken the knife away from the, the woman with the knife, that everything had suddenly become uh, uh, peaceful, perfectly sunshine, safe, happiness, rainbows. despite testimony from all the other Care bears, hugs, yeah, case. okay. All right. So this is one of the people uh, called 911 uh, immediately after this, and I'd like the uh, listeners to hear what, I guess, her interpretation of the fight was. Let's see if this works. I clicked play. I'm waiting. Let's see what happens. Here. Uh, can I, can I get, okay, uh, in, in response to that, uh, she was the first material witness called at the trial, and the first thing she said is, of course, the same, Jackie St. Hilaire, Jessica St. Hilaire, and their brother Robert Rugby, all three of them initially started their testimony with kind of like, fight, what fight? And this is 15 months after the fact, and of course, probably halfway through direct examination from the prosecutor, yeah, eventually they admit, okay, well, there was a fight, and yeah, there, there was some blood there. Um, I cross-examined this witness, and um, she actually said, oh, there wasn't really a fight, just arguing, and then she changed her story, of course, and said, yeah, there's a fight. She ran upstairs to go get help. And she also said that, oh, there, I never saw any blood on the ground, and you heard her say two or three times already on that night when we called, there's blood everywhere. The other thing that I thought was interesting, I didn't get this until a couple months before trial. They're supposed to turn everything over in June of 2012. The prosecutor turned this over in December of 2012, months late. It's, it, it's too late to have an expert go over and, and examine the audio and, and listen for the you know, the police response at the end. Um, the other thing about this, this 911 call is it's 6 minutes and 37 seconds long. And the police are nowhere near the house by their own testimony by the end of this. They're not even on Charles Henry Way. By the end of this um, this call, it's just it's going on and on. And you, when you sit there and listen to the trial, and you start cross-examining the police, you start cross-examining witnesses, uh, you start finding this. Between the woman coming downstairs into the basement with the upturned knife and beer bottle threatening to kill people and almost stabbing Jessica in the throat, between that point and the police finally getting into the house and getting into the basement was about 20 minutes, roughly. And there are no dash cams, there's no video, there's no audio recording by the police. Finally, after citizen's petition and a huge push in Seabrook, finally forced the police to accept dash cams, but I don't think they ever turned them on now. Um, and there was overwhelming public outcry and overwhelming public support, thanking me and shaking my hand for doing that. that dash cam petition, but there's no dash cam video from any of this. And uh, the, the biggest concern, the biggest issue was, was there a danger? 
And one of the things that the prosecutor did, there was evidence of three attempted murders. The woman coming down with the knife threatening to kill people, the gang leader trying to wrestle the gun from me, and a woman chasing down my housemate with an axe or a hatchet, screaming that she's going to kill him for calling the police. Now the prosecutor argued that, that attempted murder number three happened too far after the discharge of the weapon and that therefore that that should be kept out. That was kept out. And then she then goes up and argues that the police would have been there within a minute or two and that he could have just called 911 and that it wasn't dangerous at all. I mean, I guess that there wouldn't be any need to call 911 if it's really not dangerous if that's what the prosecutor is arguing. And she's keeping all this evidence out and then she goes she she goes on closing. There's no way to rebut the prosecutor on closing. You the defense closes and then the prosecutor closes. There's no way to rebut what she said. And she said, Oh, it's perfectly safe and the police would have been there within a minute or two. And she's kept out evidence of this third act of the woman chasing down my housemate with a hatchet. Really psychotic, really extreme. And what was most amazing to me was this stack of papers is about 200 pages of criminal records on the very criminals who were in my home, gang members, career burglars who testified. This is also supposed to be turned over as soon as the indictments come out. Eight in, there were eight indictments for one gunshot and maximum sentence on that is 48 years in prison and usually I think this is probably the first time in New Hampshire history that anyone's been prosecuted and convicted for firing a warning shot in their backyard. Usually it's a it's a thousand dollar fine for unauthorized use of firearms if you fire around in a suburban area. It's certainly an irresponsible act if you do it for no reason. And I certainly wouldn't advise anyone to, to do it unless it's really a life and death emergency. It's not a responsible use of firearms, but it's not a it's certainly not a felony. It's never been a felony. And usually this charge that went after Lord Bird with, and also the man in Farmington, Dennis Fleming, who fired him around into his backyard to prevent a burglar from getting away. Um, usually reckless conduct is accompanied by attempted murder, armed robbery, felony criminal threatening, murder, um, robbing a bank, shooting up a liquor store, um, shooting up occupied buildings or passing vehicles. You know, it's a, it's a really extreme danger. It's, it's just it's just a hair under attempted murder. That's what it's usually used for. It's never been used for, and I don't think anyone in New Hampshire history has ever been convicted for it. I don't think anyone's even been charged for it, even Dennis Fleming, for, for firing around into the backyard, especially not when all the police and all the witnesses have come forward and said, yeah, he, he did this to break up a fight and get people out of his house. Okay, maybe uh, I just want to ask a couple questions. Uh, you've, you've presented uh, what has happened, we've heard the 911 call, uh, and now you talk about some of the legalities. So, um, and, and obviously you were trying to break up a fight, trying to get people's attention, couldn't find any other way to get people's attention after you had verbally told them to leave your house. Um, what has been unspoken, so I guess I just want to make it clear for the listeners, I take it that you were arrested, you were indicted, you went through a trial, and uh, is all of that true at this point? And if so, uh, where does this stand at this point? Have, have you been through the trial? What was the uh, Ver uh, the verdict? <clears throat> I have been through the trial. Um, the I filed a motion at halftime to get three of the charges dismissed for a complete lack of evidence. The jury threw out four more indictments, um, and I even have a copy of the some of the indictments here. But um, the and, jury and threw out four more because of obviously lack of evidence at, at the end of the trial. But they, they picked this one unusual one that, that doesn't even specify a person who can take a look at it. But, um, the case is on appeal, and it's on appeal because the evidence is so overwhelmingly in favor of self-defense that you have multiple deadly force provocations and a homeowner responding with a single non-deadly force response. Uh, normally, if it's deadly force provocation, you're allowed to use deadly force. If it's non-deadly force, trespassing, simple assault, fighting, uh, something minor, you're allowed to use non-deadly force to respond to a non-deadly force response. But the case is on appeal, and, and, and one of the reasons, or one of the main reasons, is that the evidence was just so overwhelmingly in my favor 
when you go through the elements, witnesses are denying the elements, and when you go through the defenses, nearly all the material witnesses, and the police, and the police photos, and the 911 call overwhelmingly support um, all of the, or some of the defenses. Each of the witnesses supports at least some of the defenses. And so there's, there's no way that any rational juror, if they, if they really had understood the law, if they really understood the jury instructions, and if they really followed them, that they could have convicted. So at this point, you're still looking to have this one single indictment uh, thrown out at this point. Or a conviction, felony conviction. Fel okay, which now. means that you would be unable to own any firearms in the future. Right. Uh, you have a whole lot of other things that are taken away from you as far as your rights are concerned. And I know you are of the, the libertarian persuasion politically. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is extremely important to you. So I can understand why you're fighting to get this tossed. Well, no, there's a, there's a provision in law that says if you've been convicted of a felony, you cannot become a candidate for office. However, the way that the timing worked out, and I was able to run as a libertarian candidate for Rockingham County Attorney. So I saw, and I think a lot of other newspaper readers saw, that there was, a, there was an awful lot of evidence that this was just strictly political, that this was retaliation coming from the County Attorney's Office. Ah, the, the real department. motive! And I've had over 30 people from around town and around the area come up to me and say, you know, this this was just pure retaliation from the police department, right? And I, I of course, say yes. I've had journalists, people who've lived in Seabrook their whole lives, people who've lived in the area their whole lives, people who are close to the police department and said, you know that this is just retaliation. Yes. Could you even say that their late arrival was perhaps because you were a candidate? Uh, well, I wasn't a candidate at that time. I was a member of the budget committee asking an awful lot of asking an awful lot of questions about um, you know why is it that this police department has three times the budget of any other town outside why are we getting so many complaints from people that the police aren't showing up and responding to calls for service why do we have so many complaints about stealing from crime scenes uh, the gun range scandal is one of the biggest scandals in town history the Seabrook police officers several of them six or eight of them have caught stealing money from the gun range fund, which was money that was supposed to go to the town general fund. So they were literally, they were literally stealing from the taxpayers, um, falling asleep on detail. Um, I think one officer was caught uh, on either film or video. Uh, I think we can see why they don't want dash cams. Uh, having <laughs> yeah. relations with uh, a, a drug addict in the back of their car. They dropped charges in a DWI case in exchange for um, inappropriately mentionable sexual favor. Of which there is another case, and I want to just say for those who aren't from New Hampshire and aren't politically active and aren't familiar with this, um, we had Ed Nail on, of course, and we talk about police chiefs a lot, and there's a lot of corruption. Um, they start their little own fiefdoms, and then they have assistance from their officers, depending on how many there are, and this goes on everywhere. The new London police chief just resigned because he uh, had asked for sexual favors from a Colby Sawyer college student in exchange for dropping the charges against her. And of course, he resigned with full pension, which is $53,000 a year. And the AG has an investigation that's ongoing, and they're going to release their results of that investigation with a, in a couple weeks. And anybody who's familiar with New Hampshire knows that that's not going to amount to anything. But my question was, you know, if you have a police chief, for an example like Seabrook, where you have a guy who's been a police chief, for, he's been in the force for 27 years. Mm -hmm. This is not the first time he did this. And even though the only three or four more victims came forward, Colby Sawyer College is right there. There are young women drinking and have been for decades. This, there are probably hundreds of victims that we'll never know about, and they'll never come forward because they're too embarrassed. The toughest call I've ever had to take as, as an elected official was a phone call um, from a constituent, one of two who I heard from, who said that they were raped by Seabrook cops. And this 45-minute phone call, and this came up at trial, was uh, extremely difficult for me personally because how do you convince someone to come forward when they know that even if they come forward, there are not going to be any charges against the officer. If there are charges, they'll be thrown out, and she's going to face retaliation, harassment, and maybe even criminal retaliation. Even there was uh, another scandal in Seabrook a few years ago where. Uh, Seabrook cop wasn't fired. He had taken 86 topless photos of a 15-year-old girl against her will. And when 
he realized they were onto him. He double exposed the films, trying to erase it, but you just saw that you see the two images back in the days when he had film. He didn't delete it like, like they did with the digital camera. Another one was uh, Mark Preston. He didn't understand what a match was for. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's awful. No, the film... The, to, to film destroy, used to be flammable. The film was very flammable. I mean, if he's doing double double exposures to erase an image, I mean, there's well, obviously... Keep in, mind, keep in mind, this is a police officer who's taking photos of a 15-year-old girl. His judgment is clearly flawed to begin with. <laughs> yeah, well, I know. Well, officer, right. officer Hersey, who testified at the trial, uh, had been caught when he was a Seabrook firefighter, and they got rid of him pretty quick. Yeah. Um, he was caught stealing money from the toy bank fund at Christmas time. I mean, I, I, I don't mean to make light of it, but, you know, we, we tend to sometimes here at Granite Rock and Rock Talk uh, respond with a little bit of snark. And that's why, you know, if you if you are that stupid to get caught that way, this you is, don't even know are, what a match is. These are verbal oh. face palms, just so you know. It's yeah. like, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, and we've got lots of good small town police chiefs we around do. New Hampshire, including where I live in Hollis. But you know, uh, there's enough of these stories to worry people, and the bad ones are very difficult to find out. But I got I got to ask you this: Why not go the alternate route of the best defense is a good offense? and hire yourself a, a lawyer that's going to sue the police department for not being seconds away when well, it matter. The problem and, and allowing your house to be defiled by these people when you call for help. And that's the, that's the problem that we face is that even though a lot of people will say, well, uh, especially those in government who have often said, I, like with environmental stuff, with the Water uh, Sustainability Commission or the Sustainable Communities Environment where DES or somebody else is going, uh, some other environmental group says, well, we'll craft this law. Uh, constitutionality, oh, we don't have to worry about that. We'll let the courts decide that, which means somebody's got to bring suit, which means somebody's got to <coughs> spend money, Mike, to be able to go after the justice. And, and people have to remember that the court system is part of the government. Yeah, and, and if you've got to pay to play... dollars to get to the U.S. Supreme Court. Warren versus District of Columbia, 1977 case, where the U.S. Supreme Court said, yeah, hey, we're sorry, but these women who were... Uh, they called the police. Police did show up, knocked on the door, and then took off. They were called again, and because the police did not show up, and did not follow through, uh, three people, two women and a man, were horribly, physically and sexually abused, raped, uh, forced to do all kinds of terrible things, and were really horribly traumatized. And most people think that the police have some lawful or contractual duty to respond. If they don't respond, they don't respond. Yeah. And to bring suit would, would mean that I have to pay some lawyer you know, $5,000 right off the bat as a retainer, mm -hmm. and on an hourly basis just to bring my suit to prove that my government has done me wrong. Yes, you can go to your elected officials, but as you've seen, and, and I've got, I'm, I'm following up on an issue right now where people in my local government have not, none of them have responded to my email. I mean, what do I have to do? Oh, I know, right to know request. I will just blither them in paperwork. But if they don't respond, what is my only recourse? I have to hire a lawyer at my expense, my time, and my effort to sue the government that's not being responsive to me. It's a bad situation. Plus the $225 yeah. filing fee. And it would have been $80,000 to defend against eight indictments, even with overwhelming evidence in, in my favor. That a lot of jurors don't, don't pay attention to the evidence. A lot of them go in with the presumption of guilt. Statistically, 80% of jurors have had their mind made up by the end of opening arguments. They don't look at the evidence. Some of them don't do their job. Um, some of them go in with a chip on their shoulder. If they just decide they don't like you, they don't care what the evidence is. And uh, they don't listen to jury instructions. We had 19 pages of jury instructions. It Oof. took weeks to get through all the case law and all the statutes that were relevant to that case. And the jury doesn't hear about it until the end of the trial after closing arguments. They're not going to follow jury instructions. New Hampshire juries are, are, are famous for not following jury instructions. Well, if I had to listen and memorize 19 pages of case law, uh, and, and just the names and the dates and all of that stuff without reading oh, man. And of course, this goes back to human nature, which we started the program with. You know, you have to include that as a factor in any litigation, obviously, not just 
the, the process of do I do it, look at the goofballs that I'm dealing with that aren't responsive to me. I now have to go through a New Hampshire court system, which is also infamous for not being the best in the world, and now a jury system, which is also apparently infamous for not really paying attention. So how do you get justice? And if, if you want to claim self-defense or any defense, anything under RSA 627, I, I give out copies of these for, for, for people to get the law. I, I've given out probably 100 copies of those. Um, you have to write up a notice of defense. This has to be in the proper format. You have to send a copy to the other side. It has to go in 45 days before the original trial date. And if you miss any of it, you can't get in any evidence of self-defense, and you can't claim self-defense. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyone's welcome to have these. I've got probably a hundred more copies at home. But you have you have to write those up. You have to send it in, and you have to hope that the witnesses, if there are any, who will support those defenses, defense of others, competing harms, defense of that they will show up, and that they will remember what they told. You know, told the police and remember what they wrote in their statements if they even made any statements. Sometimes people just don't show up at trial. But this is this is kind of the hammer. This is the, the 200 pages that, of, of, of criminal records. When you get attacked, whether it's in your home or out and about, the, the jury is never going to hear about the criminal records of the people who attacked you. The 25 or 30 assault and battery convictions and outstanding warrants, the two attempted murder convictions, the assault to kill, um, numerous breaking and entering, um, felony assaults, assault with a dangerous weapon, um, you know, larceny, you name it, unless it's a, a crime of dishonesty and that witness shows up, you can only bring up, you can bring up theft, but um, I wasn't able to bring in cruelty to animals, statutory rape, um, attempted murder. Um, these things didn't get in. The jury never heard about the violent criminal history of these people. Wow. Wow. Right. And the prosecutor is not going to bring, you know, gang leaders like Paris Cormier in to testify and say, oh, no, I didn't try to pull the gun from them. I was just, I wasn't even there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's, what, when you see some of these, they did bring in one career criminal named Robert Rubke, who a, a, turns out is a, is a professional home burglar, and I wrote down a list of some of the you know, criminal convictions, and they just, they just go on and on and on and on. And some of these were null process, witness threatening, assault and battery on a household member. They were null process, meaning that they are null process, meaning that they threw the charges out for whatever reason. I really do hope that you don't have the same housemates that you did who invited these folks in for the uh, party. No, I absolutely did not. And actually, the housemate, the housemate who threw the party, it was it was like pulling teeth, trying to get the guy to, to show up. He was dodging the, the deputies, dodging process servers. He'd been subpoenaed. Uh, under threat of jail, and he still wouldn't show up, and finally just happened to show up one day at the very end of the trial, right before closing arguments, and I was able to get him up on the witness stand. Wow. Wow is wow. Well, Max, thank you for coming and sharing your story with us so that we can all be like, wow. I mean, uh, that was an awesome segment. Uh, Joe, thanks for coming in. Uh, Mike, of course, as always, for driving all the way up here to be our co-host and skip. My name's Steve McDonald. This is... Grok Talk brought to you by GraniteRock.com. We'll be back next week with more guests and more fun, I hope. I won't be here, but I will, will be. Okay. We'll see you then. And the most fun you can have on a Saturday morning. That's right. So or any other morning, news. whenever you listen to it. So you're an attorney and you defended yourself? No, I hired three. I hired an attorney, Adam Mackler, who did absolutely nothing. Didn't even show up to arraignment. But you are an attorney? No. Oh, I thought you ran for county attorney. Uh, I did, but um, you don't have to be a attorney to be one. Come on, to defend no. yourself. Just like being running for sheriff, you don't have to be law enforcement. First person. public defender just quit my case. Lost 242 pages of discovery. Lost the uh, list of witnesses for the prosecution. They they lost everything. So I was. So that sounds like that was almost uh, intentional. And then the next attorney hasn't even met with me and decides to file a Crop TV.